Hello and welcome to NATO Live Online, the show where we bring the Natural History Museum in London to your homes. From the dinosaurs in our galleries to the giant squid in our basement, join us for a chat with scientists from the museum, but also from all around the world. Today, we're taking a dive in the waters of the Triassic and discovering some of the amazing reptiles that inhabit those waters, including one that puzzles scientists for years. As always, as we chat, send in your comments and questions and we'll love to hear from you. Now, to talk about fossil marine reptiles, we have uh, with us Stefan Spickman, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the museum studying Triassic reptiles evolution. Hi, Stefan, welcome to the show. Hi, Christina, thanks for having me. It's fantastic to have you here. Now, Stefan, um, first things first, the animals that we are going to talk uh, about today lived in uh, the time of periods. They shared the earth with at the time um, period of dinosaurs. They shared the earth with dinosaurs. They might even look like dinosaurs to their untrained eyes, but they are not dinosaurs. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Um... You know, today we have multiple groups of reptiles, right? So not all reptiles belong to the same group. So today, nowadays, we have three main groups of reptiles. We have, on the one hand, we have turtles. On the other hand, we have lizards and their close relatives. And then we have um, crocodilians and birds, which belong to another group of reptiles to which also the dinosaurs belong. They're called the archosaurs. And similarly, also in the deep past, there were multiple groups of reptiles living at the same time. And not only did we have multiple groups of reptiles living on land, we also had different groups of reptiles going into the water. And some might look like dinosaurs because they are very big and scary with big teeth, but they're actually not related to dinosaurs. They're distinct groups of reptiles. Absolutely. And uh, people might be familiar with some of these fossil marine reptiles, um, maybe with ichthyosaurs or plesiosaurs. Um, mm -hmm. Is that right? Can you tell us a little bit about these these two fossil marine reptiles? Yeah, these are uh, very famous groups, especially to people who come to the Natural History Museum, because the Natural History Museum has a fantastic collection of these animals. And um, there are two separate groups of uh, reptiles that invaded the marine realm, so that went into the waters. And uh, they're both not related to any uh, sort of reptiles alive today. They are independent lineages of reptiles. Um, the plesiosaurs are quite well known, maybe even a bit better known than the ichthyosaurs, uh, also because the Loch Ness Monster was mostly based on them. So they have long necks and have flippers. And uh, then in the bottom, you have the, the ichthyosaurs, which uh, kind of look like fish because they've become so well adapted to a life in water that they also have a tail fin and, and a dorsal fin, but they're actually reptiles. So they're not fish at all. And so you can kind of look at them uh, as you should uh, dolphins and whales nowadays. Who have also similarly involved the tail fin and all and all of that they look like fish but they're not fish so in the case of dolphins and, and whales they're mammals so they're very closely related to us whereas these ichthyosaurs they were very closely related to you know any sort of reptile absolutely now um however um today stefan we're going to be focus on the marine, the fossil marine reptiles of the Triassic. Um, ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, uh, they were quite big, though there were loads of them later on in time. Why is the Triassic important, though? Why do we want to talk about the Triassic? So uh, the whole period uh, of time in which the dinosaurs were also dominant, that's uh, the Triassic, the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, uh, this entire time period is called the Mesozoic, and this is also known as the Age of Reptiles, because this was the time period when uh, reptiles were extremely diverse and grew into these very big sizes, and, and, and which is all the famous reptiles, uh, you know, from all your paleontology books. Um, and... So during the Jurassic and Cretaceous, the dinosaurs were dominant on land and in the water, it was mainly the ichthyosaurs and the plesiosaurs that were dominant. But in the Triassic, all of this was still developing and evolving. And the reason why we call the Mesozoic the age of reptiles all comes down to the Triassic. So many people will probably be aware of how the dinosaurs went extinct. This was due to a mass extinction event. It was uh, most likely the cause of a meteorite hitting the earth. 
Now, there were multiple mass extinction events like that throughout the history of life. And the very, very biggest one in the history of all of life uh, was at the very beginning of the Triassic. So uh, at, this begin at the beginning of the Triassic, the largest mass extinction event that the world ever saw occurred, killing off more than 95% of all the uh, organisms living in the water. And because of this, um, there was a lot of empty space for new groups to evolve and, and, and occupy new evolutionary niches, right? To take on new ecological roles. And this is exactly what these reptiles did. So on land, different groups of reptiles evolved, which eventually led to the uh, evolution of the dinosaurs. But also in water, a, a wide array of uh, different reptile groups invaded the oceans to take up new ecological roles. And this is what, what makes, to me, the Triassic, you know, the most interesting time period, especially for someone interested in reptiles. You're not biased at all. You're not biased. <laughs> <laughs> Um, now, Stefan, you're talking about the huge diversity of the Triassic. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the life forms, the, uh, the reptiles uh, that were alive uh, then and, and how they're, they're really amazing? Yeah, so we have um, many, many different forms. As I said, we have some of the ancestors of the um, plesiosaurs and both the ichthyosaurs were already alive at that time. So this is already the time period when their earliest ancestors were already living in the water. So we have, uh, for plesiosaurs, a group of reptiles called, called the pistosaurs or the pistosauroids. Those are the closest relatives of, um, of the plesiosaurs. And when it comes to uh, the ichthyosaurs, uh, as you can see in the bottom right, we have these very weird looking animals called hupasuchians. So you can see that they are maybe a little less well adapted to a life in water than the later ichthyosaurs are, but they are very closely related to them. And, and those hupasuchians is really a group we've only uh, been finding out about relatively recently from new fossils uh, from China. That's amazing. I think you can see the, the similarities, even for the untrained eyes, for those of us who are not mm -hmm. um, a, a paleontologists. Uh, but yeah, it, it can be there. Uh, now, there's another group that I, I really wanted you to talk about, the Placodons. Can you tell us a little bit about these bizarre um, reptiles? Yeah, so arguably the, the, the most diverse group of marine reptiles during the Triassic was the group of reptiles to which the plesiosaurs also belong. So this bigger group in which the plesiosaurs fit is called uh, the Sauropterygia. So these included these pistosaurs that we just looked at, but also uh, um, well the animals we see here, which is uh, again a pistosaur, uh, pistosaur at the top. And then in the bottom we have an othosaur, which was quite a common animal at the time and um, was a predator. Uh, uh, eating fish and, and, and prey like that. But we also had very, very small forms uh, like the pachypleurosaurs that you see here zoomed in now. So they came in all different shapes and sizes. And we have many, many fossils of these animals. For instance, from these small guys, the pachypleurosaurs, we have an entire uh, um, ontogenetic series, so an entire growth uh, range. So we have them from small embryos, actual fossilized embryos, all the way to uh, the adult animals. But then the animals, uh, um, you mentioned specifically the placodons. They're also very interesting. They're a different form of um, sarpterygian. And as you can see, they're very weird. They were armored. So they, they kind of resemble turtles in the sense that they have a carapace. So they have like a full on shield of armor. Um, but they're actually not turtles. As I said, they're sarpterygians. So they're close relatives of the plesiosaurs and these other reptiles we just looked at. And they independently evolved this type of armor that complete, uh, covered their bodies. Another interesting aspect about these animals is that they had very large crushing teeth that almost looked like just rocks uh, in, in, their, in their mouth that they used to crush uh, the, the things they ate, which was mollusks and other shelled uh, prey. So really bizarre animals that were around at the time. That's amazing. And Stefan, just to triple check, these are not related to turtles then that much, apart from them being no. reptiles. No, no. So it kind of in a similar way that uh, both ichthyosaurs and dolphins evolved this fish-like shape, uh, in the same way the, both the placodons and the turtles evolved this shell separately from each other. And you can also, when you look at uh, fossils in detail, you can see that they evolved in a different uh, different way. So, so the turtle shell is slightly differently constructed than these shells are. Mm -hmm. And uh, this wide diversity, we've seen big animals, there's more animals, animals that resemble all the animals. Some of them didn't make it to after the Triassic, did they? Um, there's, there's an example that I think it looks beautiful, at least the representation that we had, but sadly, uh, it just stayed in the Triassic, is that right? Yeah, so the, in, in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, we were basically left with the plesiosaurs and ichthyosaurs and some other groups, but 
many of those groups that evolved in the Triassic never made it into the Jurassic. They they evolved early on and, and then went extinct by the, by the time the Triassic came to an end. And one of the animals we're looking at now is called the Thalatosaur. Um, there are also uh, marine reptiles, which is a bit confusing, which are called Thalatosuchians. Um, those are crocodile relatives, but those are not the ones we're talking about. These guys are called Thalatosaurs, and Thalatosaurs kind of resemble crocs a little bit, as you can see, but they're not. So they're not a completely independent lineage of reptiles that in the Jurassic went into the uh, marine realm and evolved uh, uh, to live there. And um, the interesting thing about Thalatosaurs is that they have very weird skulls. So we have different species that have uh, different shaped snouts, different shaped skulls and different teeth, which indicate that they were actually quite diverse and eating on a wide range of things. So some might be more suited in crushing shell prey somewhat like a placodont, less extreme, but more or less the same, or others were maybe more evolved to uh, feed on fish and, and, and slippery prey. That's amazing. Again, as you said, a huge variety. Now, Stefan, we are going to start talking about one particular uh, animal that you're really interested in, but we had loads of questions coming from, from our viewers that I hope are enjoying the show. So I'm going to ask you some of those questions, but um, just a reminder for those of you watching, if you want to send your own questions, uh, please write them on the chat um, and we'll try to get through as many as possible. And also, if you're enjoying the show, uh, if you want to make a donation to the museum, you can do so by clicking the button uh, near the chat on YouTube or going directly to our website and we'll put uh, uh, a, an address on the chat so you can click in there. Um, any donation is always appreciated and if you're enjoying the show, what a better way to say thank you. But um, Stefan, going to the questions um, that our viewers were sending, um, my next set we're asking, uh, how can you tell that they are reptiles? So we were talking about how we know they're not mammals or they're not fish, but what makes them um, reptiles? Is there a particular thing that you can go, yep, this is a reptile or this is not a reptile? Um, that's a very good question. And it's actually very fundamental, obviously, to everything we do as paleontologists is what we essentially do is we try to group all of the animals, both living and extinct, into the right evolutionary uh, categories. Uh, in terms of reptiles, there are a number of um, character traits um, that we find that, that are shared by most reptiles. But the deeper you go in time, uh, the more murky this gets. So, for instance, uh, all reptiles nowadays, uh, now, uh, nowadays are all uh, what we call cold-blooded, so they have a very slow metabolism. But as we go further down in history and we look at the bones in more detail and we do more analysis on them, we actually discover that there were even reptiles that were somewhat warm-blooded. So this is not... A very easy question to answer. One um, one answer that that works as a rule of thumb for most reptiles is that um, there are in the back of the head there are uh, openings that were openings that are basically spaces for muscles to attach, and almost all reptiles have two openings. So we humans and other mammals we have one, which is your your temple. You can you can feel that even. So when you when you close your mouth, you can feel the muscles moving there. That's because there's an opening in the skull there. So most reptiles have two openings, um, which is one of the main character traits we use. But again, there are exceptions to the rule because biology, um, yeah, likes to not stick to rules. <laughs> it's always biology really likes uh, making it difficult for for the researchers. I think. Mm -hmm. But that was a, that was a great answer, uh, Stefan. Another question. This one from Andrew. They were asking, what would have had a more powerful bite? A big sea reptile or a T-Rex? Can we tell even? Gosh, um, yes, we can tell. There are ways of reconstructing uh, bite bite force in uh, in in reptiles and extinct animals. Generally, and this has definitely been done for T-Rex. Um, I'm not quite sure whether it's been done for plesiosaurs. I don't have this uh, knowledge off the top of my head, but my expectation is. Um, that plesiosaurs would not have as strong of a bite. I mean, it depends on the type of plesiosaur you're looking at. Uh, please, most plesiosaurs, they have a, quite a small head at the end of a long neck. And what they ate was things like fish and squid. So what they needed, and you can also see this in their teeth, they have these very long pointy teeth, which are basically just there for fishing, like almost like fishing spears. So you close your mouth, fish gets caught and can't go anywhere. So you don't need a lot of bite force for that. Uh, a T-Rex, on the other hand, um, you know, was also crushing bone and 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 hunting big uh, other big dinosaurs. Uh, so in that regard, uh, T-Rex had a very strong bite. But there were also some marine reptiles out there, maybe not the long-necked plesiosaurs, that had very strong bites because they were also hunting very big prey. 
That's brilliant. That's a that's a great answer as well. So yeah, if anyone has any more questions, please send them through, uh, and we'll uh, we'll try and, and answer them. And in fact, um, Stefan, just now another question arrived. This one is from Bethany. Uh, they're asking: Are the colors used in the artic artistic images based on scientific research, or artist rendition, or both? Do do you know if like the colors are approximate, or yeah. this would change in the future? Yeah. So. Um... Until very recently, we were always saying as paleontologists, you know, we, we will never be able to say anything about the colors that animals had, uh, simply because the color itself doesn't preserve. And also things like DNA that you can use to to figure out what color something might have had are uh, not preserved in, 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 in fossils that are this old. However, there have been really exciting developments in the, in the last like 10, 15 years where there are certain... Um, biological structures, uh, uh, maybe rem remnants of, of certain proteins even that, that um, or uh, of, of, of things that indicate color that we have discovered in certain uh, fossils. So for instance, for certain dinosaurs, we've now been able to give a rough estimation of what color they are. For marine reptiles, this so far has been done on, on, or we have not been able to do this in this uh, level of detail. However, there's one example I know of, of an ichthyosaur where um, I think these were melanosomes that they found where they could indicate, they could see that um, on this ichthyosaur, the top half of the body was a darker color, whereas the bottom half of the body was a lighter color. And this is not surprising at all. This is also what we see, for instance, in, in, in uh, many sharks and fish today. Like if you look at a great white shark, it's white from the bottom and dark from the top. And why is that? Well, that's because if you look, uh, if you're in the water and you look down, then you see the darkness. Um, whereas when you look from the bottom and you look up, uh, you see, you look against uh, the sunlight reflecting on the water. So there's a much more of a light background. So you see that th these animals, uh, you know, to a certain extent, uh, were doing the same thing that animals are doing nowadays. Fantastic, Stefan. That, that's, uh, that's an incredible answer. And I, it's something, it's a question that I've heard a lot of people asking in the past. So yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Stefan, one last question before we continue. Uh, Noah Hoy7 uh, uh, is, uh, is asking, uh, were megalodons around before ichthyosaurs? Do you know? I mean, you're not a megalodon expert, but do you happen to know the time when megalodons were around? I can't yeah. think of it from the top of yeah. my head. Megalodon was actually a very, very recent animal. Um, there were already ancestors of direct ancestors of us of humans walking around on the earth when when the last megalodon were still swimming in the ocean so for those who don't know megalodon is an enormous uh, predatory shark a close relative of a, of a white shark but it was extremely large and it fed on you know things like whales it was a very impressive animal so sharks as a group are very very ancient much older than any sort of reptile so there were definitely sharks around there were also big sharks around uh, as well uh, nothing as big as megalodon uh, and also nothing really closely related to megalodon so the types of sharks that were swimming around back in those days were looked quite different than 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 megalodon or a great white shark does brilliant thank you so much stefan and thank you everyone for for your excellent questions now uh to uh, go back to what we were talking about we were talking about the triassic reptiles and marine reptiles and there's one in particular that again not biased at all stefan but we wanted mm -hmm. to talk about uh, because it's, it's, it's a really cool uh, marine reptile. And also it got scientists puzzled for a long time because it's a little bit mm -hmm. bizarre. And this is Tanistrophius. It's a reptile that you've been studying in particular. So can you tell us a little bit about Tanistrophius and what makes it special, Stefan? Yeah, so Tanistrophius is the animal uh, I studied, like a large part of my doctoral degree. So my PhD research focused on this animal. And uh, as you can instantly see, tennis trophy is characterized by an extremely long neck, uh, like those plesiosaurs are. However, uh, the thing with tennis trophies is it was, um, it evolved this long neck in a very, very different way, which we can see in a little bit when, when we will look at the skeleton. But it has a very, very long neck. And uh, in contrast to things like plesiosaurs, it didn't have paddles. It just still had hands and feet like reptiles living on land do. And um, we actually also know how it's related to other reptiles. Uh, Tenostrophius was actually uh, very closely related to modern day crocodiles and birds and, and also the extinct dinosaurs. So it was actually a stem member of this group, the archosaurs, uh, that these crocodiles and birds belong to. So at the very, very base of that lineage, uh, this animal uh, lived. 
And um, yeah, so the reason this animal has puzzled humans or scientists for so long is that it has very um, weird shape that is unlike anything that's alive today, right? So sometimes, so that makes it very hard to say how this animal might have lived. And you have this very long neck that might indicate that it was living in water. We also even have some stomach content that indicate that uh, this animal was eating fish because we found fish gills in its in its in stomach content. But at the same time, you have uh, limbs and no clear adaptations for swimming. So there are no paddles or or fins. So it mm -hmm. makes it a very weird animal. Absolutely. So, uh, Stefan, where where is Stanistrophus and um, Tanistro Stanistrophus? Sorry about that. Uh, found and can you tell us a little bit more about that area? Yeah, so Tenostrophius is um, known from a number of places in uh, Europe and also in China. Many fossils have recently been found. So we do find this animal uh, quite widely spread, but most of the best fossils, almost all of the best fossils come from a single locality, which is a real actual uh, dragon mountain. It's called Monte San Giorgio. It is uh, located on the border between Switzerland and Italy. And it is an actual dragon mountain because it is a site where we find many of these fantastic marine reptiles that we're talking about today. So not only Tenostrophius, but also the Placodons we've been talking about, the Ichthyosaurus, um, those ancestors of the, the, the Plesiosaurus, we all find them in this one mountain. Uh, and this mountain is so unique for its fossil uh, fauna that it's actually been declared a UNESCO World Heritage Site because of it. That's amazing. And how long have we known um, about Tenostrophius? So Tenostrophius, the first uh, remains of Tenostrophius were actually described already in the in the uh, 1850s. So you know, over 170 years ago now. Um, and as you can see here, you can get a better idea of how weird the anatomy of this animal is. So you can see that this neck that is so long is actually composed of um, vertebrae that are extremely, extremely elongated. So the neck bones are extremely long. And these are actually the first things that, that people found, that the researchers found. So back in 1850, they just found individual bones uh, that are about, you know, this long. And they were like, well, what are these things? We have no idea. Some thought that they might be leg bones. Uh, they've also been interpreted as the, the, the tail vertebrae of, of a certain dinosaur. But only later on, when we found these more complete skeletons that we're looking at now, uh, that we realized that actually, well, they belong to the neck. And these and these fossils, they were only discovered at Monte San Giorgio, basically from the 1920s onward. That's amazing. And since since then, since the beginning, it looks like uh, it's been puzzling scientists, as we said before. Um, why why was the neck so confusing? Is it because of this big vertebra that you were you were saying, Stefan? Yeah, yeah. So essentially, this this neck is. Um, built unlike anything else in the animal kingdom so we have these vertebrae that are extremely extremely long and then underneath you see these long strut like things so these are actually ribs so reptiles most reptiles there's another reptile character for you reptiles have ribs also in their neck vertebrae so not only uh, as we do on our, in our in our chest in our torso but also in their neck and in tenostrophius these neck vertebrae became so extremely long that they covered the length of up to three or four of these vertebrae. So mm -hmm. they would have overlapped each other and forming a tight bundle, keeping this ne neck supported. So basically allowing this neck to be stable, uh, but probably also stiffening this neck. So it's a very weird uh, construction, a very weird configuration. And we think this neck was actually quite stiff, so not very movable. Which actually links quite nicely with the, the different theories about how we lived and, and, and how we ate, because the old fashioned uh, representation of Tanistrophus was that he lived in on land, right? Yeah, so there have been many, many hypotheses through the ages, uh, basically, uh, because everybody has a different opinion on this animal. But but one of the more common ones and long long standing ones is that, yes, we know that Tanistrophus ate fish. Um, but with his long neck, maybe it was sitting on the edge of the water on the shoreline and using its neck, maybe like a heron, uh, to, to, to snatch its, its prey from the water. Um, then when we later discovered that this neck of Tenostrophus is so stiff, this became you know, a, a more, more unlikely hypothesis. But there's still some people today who, who think that Tenostrophus might have lived uh, like this. Yeah. Uh, now, Stefan, we, we're talking about Tenostrophus 
as one animal. But there are two kinds of tannis trophies, right? And actually, Erica from our viewers, they were asking, how big were these creatures? And I think the answer is coming up uh, in the next question, because tell us about the two kinds of tannis trophies that were uh, out there. Yeah, so as I said, most of the tennis trophies fossil all come from this one single mountain, the Monte San Giorgio. And on this mountain, we find two different types of fossils of tennis trophies. We find uh, pretty big ones, which are the skeletons we've been looking at so far, and they could be up to five meters long in total. So a very long animal, uh, which shouldn't give you the impression that this was like a big ferocious animal. Um, because as you, as you, if you look, for instance, at the torso of this animal and look and put it next to the torso of a human, you see that the torso is more or less similar. It's just five meters long because this neck is so incredibly long and the tail similarly is also very long. So that's the, lo the large form that we found that, that has been found in Monte San Giorgio was about five meters long. And then the other form we find are all fossils that are a lot smaller. They're about like a meter to a meter and a half in, in total length. And um, yeah, they were they were both found at the same mountain, and historically they've been considered, for logical reasons, as the uh, juveniles and the adults of the same species, so as the babies and, and the grown-ups. Um, but there are some differences between these two forms, other than their size. Um, so there was already an indication that the skull uh, of the large piece in the, uh, the large form and the small form are actually quite different, and this is something um, that I want to investigate for my PhD research try and figure out, um, well, is this actually going on or not? Because the weird thing is that the, the small form has different teeth to, compared to the large form. So the small form has uh, uh, tricuspid teeth that might be used for crushing things a bit more, whereas the large form has uh, very long and, and piercing teeth. And it's so people have suggested, well, maybe the, the, the babies were just eating something else and the adults. Um, but actually, it would be quite a unique transformation for a reptile to make this through a growth series. We don't see this in many other reptiles. And uh, you did, you have studied them, Stefan, and actually you've come up with a, to, to our conclusion. Uh, have you figured out whether they are different species or juveniles and adults? Can you tell us? <laughs> Yes. So um, what we did is, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep the, the answer. Well, I guess people can guess the answer, but I'll, I'll come to that in a bit. But basically what we did is in trying to compare the small form and the large form, um, the problem was that we didn't know really how well the skull, uh, how, how the skull of the large form looked like. This is because we had a number of fossils of them as the one you see here, but they're all very strongly crushed. So uh, after fossilization, there were, or during fossilization, there were many geological processes going on. Uh, which made that these, these skulls were all very compacted and crushed together, which obviously makes it difficult to understand how this animal might have looked like in life. So we had a better idea of how the small form looked like, but not as good of an idea of how the large form looked like. But nowadays, in let's say the last 15 to 20 years, we as paleontologists have an, a, a new very strong tool that we can use to investigate these animals, which is CT scanning. So we scan a lot of fossils to give us an idea of how these animals uh, uh, might have looked like to look at fossils that, that are difficult to study by with the naked eye. And this is what we did with this skull that I just showed you. We, we put it in a very strong CT scanner, and then I spent a lot of time trying to uh, segment out, well, to digitally prepare out all the bones, essentially. And we ended up with this uh, final model. And as you can see, there are many more bones that are visible than are with the naked eye, especially here now that we look at the bottom. There are a lot more fossils that were preserved in the stone that we couldn't see before gave us a lot more insight in how the skull might have looked like but you still don't really have an idea of how this animal looked like in the flesh just because well uh, it's all still all the bones are displaced it's all crushed together it's a bit hard to see so what we then did with these digi with this, these digital bones is basically puzzle them back together in uh, the position they, they would have been in life which eventually resulted into this really nice reconstruction of the same skull this is all from the one fossil we just showed you and uh, yeah, as you can see, most of the skull is there. There are a few pieces that are missing, but really uh, virtually a complete skull was, was hidden in that rock. So that was really exciting, obviously, when we were able to, to finalize this model. And it allowed us to compare this large form in a lot more detail to the small form. I'm sorry, I can't hear you at the moment, Christina. Uh, I think you're muted. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah. So that 
I was going to say that that's the beauty of, of science uh, and seeing the image crashed and then um, and then in 3D over there. Um, but can you give us the answer, Stefan? Uh, is it young and adult or two different species? So, yeah, I think um, we have on the following slide, we, we have the skulls next to each other. So you see how uh, the large form looks like and the small form looks like. And then you can see that there's really a, a, a really big difference. So on the left, we have the large form and on the right, we have the small form. And you see the difference in the teeth that I was talking about earlier, but you also see that it's that just the general shape of the skull is very different. And, and in the, the two bottom pictures, you see actually the, the roof of the mouth, so the, the what we call the palate, and you see that that's also very, very different between the two forms. So you see that the large form only has a few teeth in the, in the roof of the mouth on, in the front, whereas the small form had basically teeth all over the roof of the mouth. So these are really two different species. So we were quite convinced after seeing this that they were two different species. But in order to be really, really sure, we did some additional research where we basically took one of the bones of the small species and took like a thin section and looked at it under the microscope and looked at the growth lines. And based on these growth lines, we could see that actually this small form was quite old, actually. And we could even see in the type of the growth lines that they were very closely bound together at the outside of the bone that towards the end of the life of this animal, it was it had basically stopped growing because it had reached adult size. So we really have now very, very strong proof that these two species, that these, that these were two different species. And that's of course very interesting because then you have two different species of Tenostrophias, both with such a very weird long neck with very different sizes and very different teeth. So they have clearly evolved to feed on different food sources and to live quite different lifestyles, even though they both have this very weird and somewhat uncomfortable looking neck. That's absolutely fantastic, Stefan. And I'm so happy that you came to, to the show to share the story of uh, Tani's trophies and also the fantastic results of uh, your research. Now, Stefan, sadly, we've reached the end of the show. Uh, and I'm sure that we could stay, stay talking about uh, these amazing animals for another hour. But I'm going to have to say goodbye to you, but hopefully see you next time. But thank you so much for being with us. And yeah, as I said before, see you next time. Bye. Thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> and thank you as well for everyone watching and for sending your wonderful comments and questions. We really appreciate, appreciate you being there. And if you've enjoyed the show, remember that you can make a donation by clicking on the button on uh, the YouTube chat or going directly to our website. We'll put a link on the chat. Um, and aside from that, that's all from us today. But uh, Nature Life Online will be back next Tuesday when Alison and Chris Stringer will be talking about the remains of Dragon Man. So join us for then. That's all from me. I'm going to say bye to you. Bye.